It's time for perhaps the most confusingly titled game in the series, Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2. The first DS title and immediate successor to KH2 made by hand as their first entry in the Kingdom Hearts series. Given its status as the first DS title in the series, I should probably count myself lucky the game isn't entirely controlled by the stylists or something like that. This is the last game in the series I owned as a kid, and thus the last one I completed as a kid. For those new to this video series, perhaps afraid this means I can't objectively judge it due to nostalgia or something like that, first of all, hello, nice to meet you. Second, you don't have to worry about that because I don't like this game very much. Well, it's more complicated than that as you'll see, but rest assured that I am not somehow nostalgia blind for this game. As for my experience playing the game this time around, I wanted to emulate the feeling of playing it on a DS and most situations in which one would play a DS. So I played it on my Steam Deck while at work for about three hours. Kinda impressed the Steam Deck is powerful enough to emulate the DS and record at the same time. Also, to be clear, I did basically the same thing with Recoded. I played pretty much that whole game at work on my Steam Deck. If anyone that I work with is watching this currently, just pretend you don't care that I got paid dollars an hour to play video games and make videos for my personal YouTube channel. Unfortunately, due to scheduling and the winter months being weird for me, I still wasn't done with my playthrough when the It Takes Two video came out. So my next decision was to play the game over the course of two back-to-back -back days off that I had to myself. This ended up working out, and I played 17 hours over those two days. I would like to state here that I don't believe that this negatively affected my opinion of the game. Anyone who's played the game probably knows that it's designed to be played in short bursts. It's mission-based and highly encourages 10-20 to 20 minute play sessions. I took this into account with structuring my analysis and I don't believe I was unfair with the game due to the experience I gave myself with it. Further emulating the feeling of playing a DS game, I decided to play most of that time with the sound muted. As a kid, I didn't carry earbuds around with me, and as a person, I despise playing sound from a phone or mobile gaming device out loud in public settings. I honestly might be a bit misophonic about it, so most of the time I played the game without sound back then, and ditto this time. So on March 16th, I started playing days at 12pm after spending the morning recording footage for a members only video, oh yeah, join my YouTube memberships. I would not stop playing until 7 that night. I listened to numerous YouTube videos in order to simulate being forced to listen to conversations while playing the game on the DS when I was younger. I started with the History of Nostalgic Screensavers by Polygon Donut. This was quite an entertaining video, definitely a blast of nostalgia to go along with the nostalgic blast I expected to get from this game but actually didn't. I enjoyed it but wasn't super into the hyperfixation branding, so I moved on to other things after that. I got around to finishing Jacob Geller's The Strangest Game of 2023 about Wanted Dead, and that is a game I definitely need to play. I listened to the style theory video about the big hat. I know people like to dig on MatPat or whatever, but his videos are high quality and much of the real world stuff like style or food theory seem well researched from my perspective. Some of the game theory videos are absolutely ridiculous, but that just makes it fun to laugh at, right? I also listened to all of the world of Five Nights at Freddy's by Thaft9 a three hour long video with impressive editing quality throughout. The comedic timing was also pretty great. That being said, loud isn't funny, friends. And it's ironic for someone who wrote this into their script. The endoskeleton will open with a sound that damn near burst my eardrums when it happened. Look at the wavelength in my editing program. This is ridiculous. To include a joke like this. Fear, if you manage to survive until the end of night five, you win. <laughs> Also, the main reason why I watched the whole thing was because he spent about 10 minutes talking about Chipper and Sons Lumber Company, and I wanted to see if it came back or mattered to the actual FNAF discussion. Alas, it did not. I stopped playing when my wife got home that night, and 12 hours later, 7am March 17th, I started once more. I listened to How Foreigners Make Japanese Uncomfortable by Mrs. Eats. Full disclosure, I have no idea how accurate any Japanese culture related YouTube video is because I know little to nothing about their culture firsthand, but I thought this was an entertaining video at any rate. Then it was Todd in the Shadows' review of Last Night by Morgan Wallen. This is the last remaining bastion of Channel Awesome that I pay any attention to. While I basically never agree with his opinions, like on anything, his video quality has only gone up over the years. Next was We Entered the World of Microsoft Excel's Esports by People Make Games. If you don't watch people make games, please remedy that. Their editorials are phenomenal and regularly hard hitting. 
I highly recommend their explorations into the morality of Roblox and how they make money off the backs of literal children. It's fascinating stuff. I also watched Microsoft Edge is objectively better, but no one wants it, biologically answered. A well-produced video kind of made me want to switch to Edge, but my entire life is in the Google ecosystem, so nah. I stopped for lunch at 11.15 a.m. I needed a break from sitting on the couch and my dog needed a break from lying on the floor, so I packed him up and went to Taco Bell. Despite the fact I definitely had food in the house I could have and should have eaten instead. It's not entirely my fault. My wife and I watched The Age of Broken Video Games by Nakey Jakey over dinner the night before and he talks a number of times about tacos, so they had been planted in my mind. Also, my dog loves Taco Bell and I needed a break from being in the house. I ordered my usual two beef quesarillos, a cheesy gordita crunch, an order of nachos and cheese, and a medium Baja Blast. I added a beef and cheese taco for the pup. I did not round up my change to help students with their education. This came out to $22.06. I would like to apologize to my wife as we are sitting here screening this video before it hits YouTube for wasting $22.06 on Taco Bell when we had food at home, but Nikki Jakey, Roxas, and Toby all had guns pointed at my head. We took the food back home and Toby enjoyed his taco very much. He loves Taco Bell almost as much as I love KH, and would absolutely make videos about it if he had the dexterity or linguistic capability. To be clear, he is already smart enough to do so, he just lacks necessary opposable digits and the complexity of the vocal folds or tongue of humans. I started playing Days again around 12 and started re-watching the Action Button review of Cyberpunk 2077. If you don't watch Action Button, please remedy that. Tim Rogers is an excellent linguist and writes some of the most insanely funny sentences in YouTube history. My favorite part of the first chapter of that video is that he spends a long portion of it discussing games and novels he played and read in the research phase of that video's production, except it turns out that he's stalling for time because he doesn't actually want to talk about Cyberpunk 2077 sort of like what I'm doing right now. Huh. It's not that I don't want to. It's that I'm afraid to, honestly. I'm not going to tell you why. Not yet. That'll be for the end of the video, but it has to do with this. From a gameplay standpoint, Days is not just the worst Kingdom Hearts game I've spoken of so far. It's also the worst game I've spoken of on this channel. Which, I only really talk about good games anyway, so that's not as blasphemous of a statement as it sounds. But I have seriously thought about this, and I think it's true. Alright, it's time to support that statement. Let's just go ahead and discuss all the good stuff this game has to offer. Most of it is contained in and around the level up slash equipment slash ability system known internally as the panels system. This is a big page full of square slots. In these slots, you place the titular panels in order to increase Roxas' level, augment his abilities, give him different keychains and other equipment, and equip spells and battle items. If you watched the Recoded video, which you should do if you haven't, it's a good one, you might recognize the general layout, but Recoded took the system and did it better. Just by the way, this is the last and only time I'm going to say that. If you see something in this game that reminds you of something in Recoded, just assume it was done better there. Granularly, each effect that can augment Roxas' capabilities has a panel tied to it, and they each behave slightly differently, both from each other and how they have worked in the series up till this point. For example, magic must be equipped, and each panel gives Roxas one cast of the relevant spell, sort of like a battle item. We'll talk more about the specific spells later, because they are actually pretty unique in this one. Level up panels are also equipped in this menu, each increasing Roxas' level by one and incrementing his HP, attack, defense, and magic by a certain amount depending on the level, just like in the other games. Due to this, a level 1 playthrough of this game would simply require not equipping the level up panels, though I would highly advise against this. Certain panels will have link slots, represented by these blank squares attached directly to the primary panel. This means they take up more space, but can augment anything you install into it or the primary ability they grant. For example, magic doublers take any magic panels in their link slots and give you two casts of that spell instead of one. Magic triplers give three casts, and so on. Level doublers and triplers work the same way for level panels. These are especially useful but take up a ton of space, and so careful planning must be used in order to get the most out of the space given. Occasionally, you will get access to an ability, such as block, dodge roll, or air slide, which also has link slots attached to it, meaning you can augment that ability with other panels. Fitting a perfect block panel into a block's link slot will allow you to reduce the recoil you experience from blocking by timing the block to just before the attack would hit. There's lots of other ability panels that can be augmented to fit your playstyle, though I never found these useful personally. 
Weapon panels change the Keyblade into a different form, just like keychains in prior games, and usually come with link slots of their own. You can slot ability panels, magic panels, and power panels into these link slots, which unlock new abilities for the Keyblade, increase your magic stat, or your strength stat, respectively. Keyblade abilities usually manifest in a similar manner to the abilities attached to keychains in previous games, though there are some unique ones here. Magic Bracer allows you to complete casting a spell even if you take damage during the animation. There are also abilities that give your finishers a chance to deal status effects to the target, a particularly useful skill set because magic is insanely overpowered in this game, as we'll see momentarily. The weapon panel itself also heavily augments your weapon's reach and combos. They come in three specializations, physical strength, magic, or a mix of the two. Typically, the keyblades that specialize in physical strength have longer, more complex, more fluid combos where those that specialize in magic power have shorter, more stunted, less complex combos. We'll talk more about these in a bit as well. Finally, you can save arrangements as decks and exchange them out at will in between missions. The game heavily implies, and somewhat incentivizes, changing your panel arrangement depending on the mission you are about to undertake. Each mission has a briefing that usually lists the main enemies you will be fighting, and many enemies are weak to specific spells or abilities. This clearly encourages updating your arrangement based on the mission, and to the game's credit, this is a fun system to tweak. It's got this almost tetris -y effect, where fitting all the items and spells you need in and around the magic doublers, level doublers, and abilities with link slots is not only satisfying on its own, you also feel the increase in power while in the missions. It acts as a feedback loop, where your time in the missions is more enjoyable because of the time you spent in the panel menu, and so you spend more time in the panel menu next time in order to properly prepare and increase your enjoyment of the next mission. Equipping spells is particularly important to this feedback loop, because all the time you spend making sure you have the right spells for the job is rewarded by allowing you to destroy multiple health bars in literal seconds. But I guess that's more about the balance of the game, isn't it? Now, all of this sounds really good, right? It gives you plenty of player expression and lots of options for how to build Roxas. It also encourages you to change your loadout depending on the mission, giving each mission a slightly unique feel, and changing up your gameplay style multiple times so you can engage with all the different mechanics the game has to offer. Well, yes and no. While everything that I've said positive about the panel system is true, the problem is that, for the most part, people's panel decks are going to end up looking pretty similar out of necessity. For example, everyone that isn't doing some funky challenge run is going to equip every level doubler and tripler they come across. The game is highly stats-based, and the ability to double your level with these level doublers is not only encouraged, it's clear that the developers fully expected you to do so. At the end of KH1 and 2, on standard difficulty, you will, on average, be around level 40 to 50. If you use the level multipliers you get throughout this game, you will, on average, reach around level 40 to 50 by the end of this game as well, meaning the level spacing and balancing is roughly the same if you use the doublers. Ditto for things like magic multiplier panels. Even if you don't cast magic as a core part of your build, which you would be a fool to do so in this game, but that's not the point, you'll likely be carrying cures with you into every mission, and the multipliers make better use of that space in the panel arrangement, so it's only a good idea to equip them. There's very little opportunity cost here. Furthermore, most players will equip most of the abilities they come across, and the game highly encourages this as well. Dodge roll, block, air slide, glide, all of these are must-haves, and some enemy attacks are practically impossible to dodge without them. Some bosses, such as the Infernal Engine, encourage dodge roll, while any time you fight any version of the Zip Slasher encourages blocking. You might consider unequipping these abilities in favor of more magic or items for certain missions, but you can't be entirely certain what you'll be fighting in some of the missions including the boss missions, which usually just say, an unidentified heartless has been found in X location, eliminate it. And so not going in with basic defensive necessities like block or dodge is just begging to have to restart after reinstalling those panels. The main area in which panel arrangements will differ will be in the equipped weapon panel. This is the best element of the panel system in terms of its implied player expression, as the many different weapons carry many different combinations of combos, strengths, weaknesses, and abilities. The Keyblades in this game are much more varied than those of Recoded's, though don't get this sentence twisted. That does not mean they are better, just more varied. I'll explain why when I talk about keychains in more depth. The other area where things will differ is the magic and battle items equipped, as well as perhaps which abilities they use just the basic version of, or the upgraded linkable version that takes up more space. 
I would praise all of the different linkable panels for the abilities, such as the multiple versions of block that can be equipped, but overall I find most of these superfluous. Many of the ability link panels are just increasing the level of the relevant ability, a sort of vague mechanic that isn't really noticeable in actual gameplay, and therefore doesn't encourage its use in place of other things like more spells or battle items. I personally stuck to the basic, one slot versions of most of the abilities, and I was on the hardest difficulty, so these things definitely aren't necessary by any means, perhaps good for further customization, but might not have met its full potential. The final thing that limits this system's potential is that the game is just a bit too generous with panel slots. At the end of many of the missions in the game, you automatically unlock a slot releaser, which just gives you another panel slot to work with. For the most part, you can equip 90% of the stuff that you could possibly want, including all of the level multipliers you need, as long as you've played a couple minutes of Tetris in your life, or you've loaded 50 square feet of boxes into a 30 square foot U-Haul truck. There was only one time during my playthrough where I truly had to give up and compromise my goals for an arrangement because I purely did not have enough space for what I was trying to equip. I tried for a while, but just couldn't make it happen. Hopefully I found the section in the editing process and you're watching a time lapse of it right now. Otherwise, I found it fairly easy to have everything I wanted and still had space left over for random spells or battle items. Occasionally, I had to spend some time readjusting, but I never had to make significant cuts to my deck, even for the massive level doublers, and that's including the fact that I did very little of the optional side missions which also have slot releasers in them. If the system was stingy enough with slot releasers that you had to really consider what's most important, it would have found fuller potential. Even better idea, what if the number of slot releasers earned was determined by the difficulty you chose? As it is, the difficulty levels only determine how much damage Roxas takes and how much health is recovered when picking up HP prizes. This would have made each difficulty feel inherently different and given proud mode more of a reason for existing, as it would encourage more careful use of the best system the game has to offer. What Recoded got right here was making the system focus on stats rather than level ups and abilities. Each open slot and chip represented an opportunity to further optimize your digital Sora into the specialization you wanted. Those that primarily wanted a melee focused Sora would have a very different looking chip set than those that focused on magic. It could be further specialized by focusing on defensive or offensive capabilities, as your survivability was also tied into this system. Abilities were unlocked incidentally as you completed the grid, and equipment existed on its own, admittedly dense progression path. The multiplier function also served to further allow the player to specialize in certain areas, maximizing the stats you want and further neglecting the stats you don't care about. Level up chips were still there, but functioned more like a nice bonus than the main focus of the system. In days, it feels like every panel you get is borderline required and you have enough space for all of them anyway, so it's not a concern. For a first attempt at a very different progression system, it's serviceable, it just lacks those extra steps of refinement and it needed to be great rather than good. Getting into the moment to moment combat, we should first start with physical combos. They function exactly the same as the rest of the series, except now each Keyblade has a somewhat unique moveset. Some Keyblades have longer strings of attacks that often hit larger portions of the area around Roxas, whereas some have shorter and more disjointed combos that kind of feel like a burden at times. This is tied to their specialization. Keyblades that specialize in magic will have these quote unquote bad combos, as in the short, stilted ones that don't flow very well, whereas Keyblades that specialize in physical power will have the quote unquote better combos, those that are longer and more complex. The ironic thing about this is that the opposite is true. The quote unquote bad combos attached to magic focused keyblades are actually the better ones because of the way the game handles enemy staggering. Enemies only stagger when you hit them with finishers, and so combos that take extra long to get to the finishers will often result in you getting hit during the combo, defeating the purpose of having longer and more wide sweeping combos in the first place. The faster you can get to the finisher, the better, which often means using the magic focused keyblades that have shorter combos. For many of these, the air combo is only two hits, a basic strike and a finisher, and is an excellent option for quickly staggering and stagger locking enemies. This isn't even to discuss bosses which often don't stagger at all, meaning longer combos leave you dangerously open to boss retaliations and limits how many times you can hit the boss with your strongest attack, the finisher, during their downtime. What was clearly a balancing change made by the developers in order to make magic focused keyblades bad at physical combos backfired pretty hard, making magic builds even more powerful than they already were. Some keyblades, especially those later in the game, get a Y combo option. This pops up as a button prompt during a physical combo, and typically manifests as a quicker way to get to the finisher by mashing Y instead of the usual combo button. A pleasant addition to be sure, but it's not the best possible use of a system like this. 
It also exists on the same button as dodge and block, meaning dodging and blocking out of certain combos can become more tricky than necessary solely because of its inclusion. With no way to turn it off, it strikes me as incredibly odd, especially to put it on the block button when the jump button is right on the other side of the controller and isn't as useful in the middle of combos. To be frank though, none of this matters nearly as much as usual because physical combos take a pretty hefty backseat to magic this time around. Rather than having an MP pool through which you can cast spells, each spell you equip now has a number of casts equal to the number of spell panels you installed prior to the mission, which can be augmented by magic multipliers of course. To put this into perspective, you can have anywhere from no casts in a spell to upwards of 50 depending on how you outfit your panel deck, and getting there wouldn't even be particularly difficult. Further separating this system from KH1 and 2's magic is that each version of a spell has unique properties, as opposed to each version of a spell merely being a beefier, upgraded copy of the original. In Days, Fire is a homing fireball that tracks down your target. Fyra shoots a fireball straight out from Roxas. Faraga is more like a mortar, shooting straight up and slowly falling down while softly tracking the target. Blizzard sends out a crystal of ice that pursues enemies, passing through them multiple times. Blazara and Blazaga both function more or less like a landmine that detonates when enemies get close. Cure is just like the other games, healing Roxas for a set amount of HP on cast. Cura heals you for more, but over a longer period of time. Kiraga puts down a healing aura that heals all team members in it, particularly useful in the multiplayer mode. Thunder brings down a string of lightning bolts in a straight line. Thundara brings down multiple lightning bolts in an area around Roxas. Thundaga is one single powerful bolt of lightning that hits a target directly. Arrow shoots a gust of wind with soft homing properties at the target. Aurora shoots a larger gust of wind that stalks foes across the ground. Aroga generates a whirlwind around Roxas that pulls targets toward him. That's all the magic in the game. As for its usefulness, Fire and Fyra can both decimate enemies in just a couple casts. In some cases, even just one cast will do. Blizzard and its various versions I find to be very underwhelming in both power and practicality. Thundara and Thundaga can rip many enemies and bosses to shreds. I never use Arrow, something of a weird stigma that I have against the spell for some reason. Cure is less powerful than potions, but has the benefit of being able to be restored by ethers, while Cura is quite a bit more effective if you know how to use it. Magic overall is busted in this one. Here's some clips of me destroying multiple health bars in a single cast of fire. Even some bosses can be trivialized with magic. Keep in mind when watching this that this footage comes from my proud mode playthrough in which I did incredibly minimal side questing. Honestly, I would have been better off getting rid of my casts of fire and Faraga and just carrying 20 or so casts of fire for most situations. It's an incredibly powerful spell alongside tracking its target. One thing that is completely unique to this game is the limit system. Limits are accessible after taking a certain amount of damage, denoted by the orange portion of your health bar. Holding the attack button when at this low level of health will power up the Keyblade, giving you access to a very strong, wide-sweeping combo that rips through all surrounding enemies. Its high reward is balanced out with high risk, as you must remain at this low amount of HP in order to use the limit, and you're not invincible during it either. Limits are a bit of an oddity on Proud Mode because getting to that amount of HP without dying is actually pretty difficult when damage is cranked so high. They do justify their existence, especially on bosses, as they can be used to eliminate numerous bars of health with ease, so long as you don't take any damage in the interim. Later on, you get a single panel called Final Limit, extending the limit timer and giving you even more of the combo. I actually really like this system due to its incredibly high risk, high reward nature. I wouldn't mind to see this one come back at some point, honestly. Battle items function the same as the other games, essentially. Each item panel you install gives you one item to use in the field during missions. Potions restore percentages of HP, with high potions having a higher percentage than basic potions. Ethers restore one charge of every spell you have equipped. High ethers restore three charges. This is good for ethers, as they are quite valuable with this functionality. 
It also encourages you to use at least one charge of each spell before throwing off an ether, meaning there's some give and take and strategic consideration to be had, which I'm always for. Elixirs restore all HP and all casts of magic. This may sound insanely powerful, and that's because it is, but elixirs have been made very hard to come by this time around. If you can find them in missions at all, they are very rare, and basically need to be crafted using a bunch of high potions and high ethers along with a couple other items. Their value justifies their cost, however, especially in the late game. Finally, for the general overview, your party members, this time populated by the other organization members, have decent capability to kill enemies, though you won't usually notice them. You also can't customize their behavior, so there's really not much to say about them. The game is split up into numerous days, each day consisting of one mission. Occasionally, you'll have more than one mission in the list, which you can undertake. Doing one of these missions will increment the day counter forward one. Some of these missions are required, and they are labeled with little keyblade symbols. The others are not required and don't have much story attached to them. Once all the required missions are complete, you can use the advance button in the mission menu to jump to the next story beat, skipping all the optional missions you haven't completed, though they can always be taken on later in the hollow mission mode. Each mission has a primary goal, which are matter-of-factly stated in the mission title in most every case. The one you'll be doing more than any other is the Collect Hearts mission, which sees you simply killing a certain number of Heartless. Most every mission has a required level of completion and an optional higher level of completion, so you usually don't have to do everything a mission has to offer if you just want to move on to the next one. Another type of mission you'll encounter, though usually only in the optional tasks, is to collect emblems. A bunch of weird organization emblems appear all over the world and you have to collect them, earning more points if you get them before these timing circles run out. One you will see often is the Gather Intel task, in which you must go around and investigate all the spots the developers thought looked important. Usually this is fine, but some of them are pretty esoteric and hard to find. Lastly, in the list of core tasks you'll be completing is the one where you hunt a particular Heartless. Often this is a boss or mini-boss. There are a few other mission types, but those are the main ones you'll encounter. Admittedly, these do get repetitive and boring at times. It's not a fault of the mission structure on its own, as it's been done better in other games. Peace Walker and MGS5 come to mind. It's mostly due to the missions feeling completely rote. Everyone ends up playing out mostly the same. Whether you're technically gathering intel or hunting for a particular Heartless, you're still just wandering around in the world fighting random baddies until you've incremented the bar enough that you can go home. The game encourages you to finish every mission, as completing numerous missions in a chunk will multiply the rewards of any mission you complete after that point. I actually like this because you can look at the mission rewards and figure out which ones you'd rather have multiplied by two or three, since you can't get all of them multiplied. It's another aspect of this game having some really neat strategic choices, but most of them being in menus or outside of combat in general. Speaking of combat, let's talk about the feel of the game during gameplay. Combos have an airy quality to them, and feel pretty awful. And before you shove this down my throat, this is with or without sound. Daze's combat is just weightless, not floaty mind you, because that's a different word with a different meaning that we'll be discussing in another video, but weightless and punchless. There doesn't feel like there is any impact. This is primarily due to visual feedback. Enemies don't react to hits most of the time, with the exception of finishers, there's less particle explosions on hits, and Roxas's animations don't imply strength behind the attacks, he just sort of limply moves through them. It's not just a problem with Roxas, by the way, playing as other characters in the multiplayer mode shows the same issue, not to mention enemy attacks. Movement feels quite stiff, though no worse than recoded, so I don't know that I can really fault the game for this one. On the positive side, challenges are rarely built off your movement abilities, so at least this game doesn't try and force you to use the sluggish movement for platforming gauntlets or anything like that. Air Slide in particular feels terrible, as useful as it is. There's also a bit of delay to the controls. This could be more due to the game running at 30 FPS, but so did KH1 and 2 originally and they felt fine, so I'm not going to entirely blame it on that. The delay between spell casts also contribute to this sluggish, unresponsive feeling. You can't cast another spell until a few seconds after the last one has completed, which means Thundara and Blizzard both lock you out of casting spells for a significant amount of time. Mashing a magic button gives you no feedback that it should even be failing to work, like in other KH games where they will play this negative buzzer sound anytime you try to do something you're not ready for. Even in the menu they don't gray out when not available to be cast, so it's a frustrating endeavor trying to guess when your next spell will be ready to go. I have no doubt this was done in an attempt to balance magic a bit, since you could spam spells in KH1 and less so in KH2, but frankly the negatives of this change greatly outweigh the positives. I would have much rather had spammable spells that actually dealt a reasonable amount of damage as opposed to obliterating entire bars of health. 
All of this combined makes for a swamp-like bog of a game feel experience, and it results in the game feeling even more outdated than it should. The gameplay on its own is so not fun that even if the mission structure was creative and well done, it wouldn't matter because the feel of the game is so off. I feel the need to clarify here that I'm comparing this game mostly to Recoded, which came out a bit over a year after this one and was developed by the same team. So clearly they were capable of making a game feel mostly good on the DS, they just fell far flat in this iteration. If I were to start really comparing the feel of this game to a console counterpart, it would not only be a slaughter fest, but also completely unfair to this game as it has more hardware limitations it is pushing against. But since Recode had proved it was possible, that paints this game's gameplay and feel in a much worse light. Every mission takes place in one of the game's worlds, and often only in a small portion of that world, blocked off by impenetrable barriers. Every mission also has a number of chests proudly displayed on your HUD at all times. Chests contain anything from battle items to synthesis materials to new panels and slot releasers, and this actually works really well. Any battle items acquired in this fashion can be used on the missions they are retrieved in too, so chest hunting is often a wise decision if you find yourself lacking in healing items in the middle of an excursion. Exploration is also rewarded with hidden enemies, especially tough versions of Common Heartless that reward you with extra completion points, heart points, and items. To be honest, the exploration of this game is largely handled well. Better, in fact, than even Cage 2, because of its relative lack of linearity in its missions. Not to say that they aren't mostly linear, but they will include offshoot sections of the map that don't pertain to the mission at hand, as opposed to Cage 2, which largely feels like a straight shot the majority of the time. One baffling aspect of this is that, at the end of each mission, you have to return to the portal you came in from in order to leave when the mission is over. A unique quirk of this game is that enemies don't ever respawn. There's a set number of Heartless in every mission and they can never come back once defeated unless you restart from the beginning or redo the mission at a later time. Seeing as your goal is often set as far away from the starting point as is possible given the world layout for the mission, you should be able to discern the problem here without me saying it outright, but I will in case you can't. There is no purpose in making the player run all the way back to the portal, it simply wastes time. Look at some of these backtracking times and keep in mind that I have fast forward turned on through RetroArch, so the game speed is a little closer to double its usual and I'm speeding up the footage so you can see more of it. The easiest and most logical way to fix this is to include a return to castle button from the pause menu once the mission is over. Now this would require a slight restructure of the game's cutscenes, as the reason this was done is because cutscenes will often take place at the portal before you leave. The fix for this is also quite simple, just make them play automatically when the player uses the RTC function in the menu, or if they return to the portal to physically RTC. Alternatively, you could make the cutscene missable if you don't enter the trigger point for the scene. Most of these cutscenes in themselves are a waste of time, for reasons I'll discuss momentarily, so this would not be a grave loss by any means. The reason I'm harping on this so much is because this is likely the longest KH game to date depending on how much side content you do, so for it to waste so much of your time just feels like a bad look, especially when it was so avoidable. Occasionally the game will force you into an obligatory stealth section. I feel like I've been seeing a lot of examples of this recently on the channel. Why is it that the games industry can't keep a dedicated stealth series afloat but regularly shoves it in where it doesn't belong? Anyway, the stealth in this game is mostly fine. Enemies are given nice, obviously visible awareness indicators, taking any guesswork out of it. Honestly, if you ask me, this is the way to go for non-stealth games with stealth sections. Just make it super obvious what the expectations are, and let the player figure it out that way. It limits frustration and allows for quicker and more offensive play. The Garden Maze sections in Wonderland are actually kind of fun to stealth around. The parts of Beast Castle are a bit too simple to even matter. The only poor inclusion in this context is the sections where you have to follow someone without them spotting you. It's a bit too awkward because you also can't get too far away from them or lose sight of them, so this ends up becoming trial and error as you slowly figure out their walking pattern. It only happens like once in the mainline missions though, so I'd say it's not really worth worrying about too much. The stealth in this game is obligatory and an odd inclusion, but has a mostly neutral outcome whenever it happens, if not a bit positive in the case of the Wonderland Garden mazes. Each mission takes place in one of the eight worlds. Twilight Town, Beast Castle, Wonderland, Halloween Town, Agrabah, Neverland, Olympus Coliseum, and rarely, the world that never was. Twilight Town is a carbon copy of its KH2 version. The rest of the worlds are all exactly the same with some additions on the outskirts. The Beast Castle includes a single new area in the attic of the castle. Wonderland includes the two new garden mazes but loses all of the on-the-wall rooms. Halloween Town is a carbon copy of its KH1 counterpart. 
Agrabah changes up the look and size of the Cave of Wonders, reducing its room count by a pretty significant amount, but changing up what's left. Neverland is the most new of the returning worlds, with two large explorable areas and Hook's ship, which is a bit different from the KH1 version. Olympus Coliseum is a carbon copy of its KH1 counterpart, just with slightly different arenas in which you fight during the games. The world that never was contains only one new room, the gray area, in which no actual gameplay even occurs. Missions that happen there are almost always confined to a single room. It occurs to me at this point that this is the second game in the series, if you don't count Coded, that did little to nothing to change the Disney worlds you visit, reusing wholesale entire zones and assets and even entire worlds. For literally any other series, this would be a huge sticking point, a big mark off of quality, but for some reason, KH has gotten a pass for the most part. At least, I don't really hear people talking about it, and I don't recall people talking about it in the past either. Up to this point, this game was the worst offender in this regard. Chain of Memories reused worlds, but had the benefit of a unique art style to make the worlds feel distinct. This game uses the same art style as KH 1 and 2, and rips most of its worlds straight from those games with minimal changes, giving it that been there done that feel. Could you imagine if the second Ratchet and Clank game came out and it had all the same worlds as the first game and largely in the same order? Or what about Super Mario Galaxy 2 having all the same levels as the first game, just with slight additions here and there? Or what about MGS2 just being Shadow Moses again? Oh wait, that actually was supposed to be the point. No series to my knowledge reuses assets to this degree, and it's really strange that KH has, for the most part, gotten away with it for so long. Thankfully, going forward, this will start happening less. Not never, mind you, just less. As for the stories of the Disney worlds, believe me when I say this is the most useless they have ever felt. Firstly, they are exceptionally boring and told in the most rudimentary style possible. Roxas will just be plodding along minding his own business when suddenly two Disney characters will appear and start to jibber jabber at each other, bafflingly, and despite the fact that Roxas acts like he doesn't care 90% of the time, he stands around and listens to these conversations. This is how the story of the Disney worlds is told to us. Roxas does show interest in Tinkerbell at the least, and something Genie tells him actually sticks with him for a while, but for the most part, these scenes come and go with no fanfare and no real point. Most of them are clearly trying to have the characters go through a struggle or learn about something that is significant to Roxas' story, but even with that, it's hard to care when our main characters clearly don't care all that much. They also perhaps show a parallel to the unfeeling nature of the nobodies, as the people in the Disney worlds have ambitions, feelings, and people they care about. But again, it's hard to look past the way it's all presented because it just feels like the Disney stories are wasting your time here. This is really the worst example of the problems I've had with the Disney stories this whole time. They feel inconsequential and even a bit detrimental to the games as a whole. So inconsequential, in fact, that Square Enix clearly agrees with me, as they were mostly cut from the remastered cutscene compilation, or at least relegated to short text blurbs that barely suffice as a TLDR for what was actually said. So there's that. In the gray area of the world that never was, other organization members will hang out in between your missions. You can talk to them to hear the latest gossip and occasionally get little mini quests that require you to grab a certain item, unlock a certain number of chests, or finish a certain mission with full completion. This is a positive inclusion, very much so in fact, as it gives each of the characters some time to talk about things other than work, and to show their characters a little bit in the things they care about or the way they speak. The Moogle shop here will be updated with new stock after certain mission junctions. You purchase items with heart points collected from beating Heartless, and can synthesize using money and synthesis materials. This is also good, probably one of the more interesting synthesis and shop systems the games have had so far. Gameplay-wise, this game has all the building blocks of a KH game, but struggles to actually build something coherent out of them. The parts that work come with caveats, and the parts that don't rarely even need clarifications. Combat is stiff and sluggish, lacks any sense of weight, and the balance is wildly off-kilter. The progression system is impressive, but lacks refinement, ultimately funneling players into having similarly built decks out of necessity. Worlds are as dull and lifeless as ever. Exploration is rewarded well, but that's about it. Probably its biggest failing is just in attempting to take the exact gameplay style of the console games and dropping it onto the DS, something that even the more impressive Recoded didn't really do. Chain of Memories did the smart thing and added a new, gimmicky layer on top that became its bread and butter, separating it from comparison with KH1, a comparison that would not have been favorable for it. Days unfortunately invites that comparison just by virtue of it borrowing so many mechanics straight up from the console games. What all this comes down to is that Days is the first game in the series that I can honestly tell you that you shouldn't even bother emulating. It's dull, repetitive, and the gameplay itself can't justify the investment, as the other games in the series do everything that it does better. 
With the release of the HD cutscenes, I truly don't know that there is any point in playing this one anymore. Perhaps only if you care for the ludonarrative harmony present throughout the game, as it relates to Roxas' story. The story, on the other hand, is something I can get behind, especially if experienced in the form of the HD cutscenes. The use of 3D models in the original game meant that in every scene, everyone had this sort of blank expression on their face that was overall neutral to whatever was going on. Nomura expressed in an interview for Recoded that this art style didn't really pan out, and I'm inclined to agree. The HD cutscenes fully animate facial expressions to the same level of quality as the numbered titles, and it elevates everything drastically. The acting on display here is also good for the most part. As for the story itself, it obviously centers on Roxas. Xemnas comes to him and gets him to join up with the organization. A week later, another new member shows up, number 14, Shion. Most of the time in these early stages of the game, she wears her hood up, but later we see that she almost looks like a jet black haired version of Kairi. Roxas and Shion hit it off, and Roxas also becomes good friends with Axel. For a long while, the game takes on an almost slice of life structure to its narrative design. After every mission, Roxas will join up with Axel, Shion, or both of them, on top of the clock tower to eat ice cream and discuss their days and what's on their mind. Furthermore, numerous important conversations play out that show Roxas working through the struggles of coming to terms with not having a heart, and what that really means. In some ways, the story aims to even emulate Saturday morning cartoons, in the sense that every episode will have a lesson the main character will learn by the end of the day. Roxas learns a lot through this process, largely about what it means to be friends with someone, as well as more details about nobodies and what they are actually capable of. Later in the game, it's revealed that Shion is actually a replica, a blank slate meant to copy Sora and his Keyblade abilities. This harkens back to the Riku replica from Chain of Memories, a being created by Vexen. The intention was to create their own pawn of a Keyblade wielder, but the surprise came in the fact that Shion began to develop a personality. What's interesting about this is that this is essentially the same thing as what happens to Repliku in Chain of Memories. When he comes into contact with the real version of himself, he begins to recognize his replica nature and wants to correct it. Shion doesn't desire to correct it, but does begin to find a self that makes sense for her. While she didn't come into contact with Sora in any point, she did come into contact with Roxas, which is basically the same thing. I like this, it's a neat twist on the replica idea established in Chain of Memories. We learn that this is due to Roxas storing Sora's memories of Kairi inside of Shion. That's why she appears as almost like a nega Kairi in a sense. Well, to be more accurate, she appears differently to everyone, to most appearing simply as a blank hooded figure. This is exemplified in certain scenes in which she will randomly have her hood up in some shots, and then in the ones that focus on Roxas and his perspective, she will appear as Shion. Her having the memories of Kairi inside of her results in Sora's recovery in the flower pod coming to a standstill, and so Diz sends Riku to eliminate her. Roxas also begins to lose much of his power, reflected in gameplay by the game reducing your level by half and having her deal much of the damage. On day 149, Shion is attacked by Riku. Later, Riku treats her a little more kindly. She begins to see Riku as someone she can confide in after he places an ultimatum on her, save yourself or save Sora. Meanwhile, Roxas becomes more and more frustrated with the lack of answers he is getting from even his close friend, Axel. Who am I really? I'm special like Shion, I know that. But the organization wanted me out of the picture. Am I right? Yeah, they did. I guess it's because Shion copied my powers and the Keyblade's powers, and they didn't need me anymore. And Axel, I guess you felt the same way. You're wrong there. You'll always be my best friend. Best friends are supposed to be honest with each other. Who am I, Axel? Xemnas says... Me and Shion are connected to each other through Sora. I don't even know a Sora. Am I a puppet like Shion? You're different from Shion. Then why do- Finding out the truth doesn't always work out for the best. What makes you so sure about that? I have the right to know the truth. How did I even get here? Why am I so special? Where did I learn how to use the Keyblade? I hardly know who I am. What is so wrong with wanting some answers? Roxas. I need to know, Axel. Please. Who am I? You've just got to trust me. 
Roxas. I don't. I can't. Roxas! Somebody knows where I came from. If I can't get answers here, I'll get them somewhere else. That'll be the person I trust. Ultimately, Shion decides to go back to Sora, but also decides she will try and take Roxas with her. Roxas, I'm out of time. Even if I'm not ready, I have to make this choice. You have poured so many memories into me, given me so much, that I feel like I'm about to overflow. Look at me, Roxas. Who do you see? If you see somebody else's face, a boy's face, then that means I'm almost ready. This puppet will have to play her part. Roxas? This is him. It's Sora. <sighs> You're next, Roxas. I have to make you a part of me, too. Don't you see? This is why I was created. They fight, Roxas wins in the end, and then this happens. Who are you? Again? It's weird. I feel like I'm forgetting something really important. You'll be... better off now, Roxas. <sighs> One who did this to you? No. It was my choice to go away now. Better that than to do nothing and let Zemnis have his way. I belong with Sora. And now I am going back to be with him. Roxas, I need you to do me a favor. All those hearts that I've captured, kingdom hearts, set them free. Kingdom hearts? Free them? It's too late. You need to undo my mistakes. But you can't let Zemnis have Kingdom Hearts. You can't. Goodbye, Roxas. See you again. I'm glad I got to meet you. Oh. And of course, Axel too. You are both my best friends. Never forget. That's the truth. Uh, no! Shion! Who else will I have ice cream with?
One effective aspect of this game's narrative is the organization and their plans with Shion. I have praised the villains of the series multiple times over for being adequately menacing and capable. They don't fall into the bumbling villain trope as many others do. The idea to create a replica intended on copying Sora's powers that they could bend to their will is a fascinating one, especially considering they had already had Roxas for a bit when she showed up. It's possible, given the timeline, that she was already in the works before this, however, and Roxas just happened to fall into their lap at about the same time. This is supported by Repliku being sort of a short-term test run to see how well the concept would work. Unfortunately, during the course of this game, Vexen dies at Castle Oblivion, meaning the scientist who created the replicas was no longer around to focus test them or work out any bugs. That too is an aspect of the organization that I love in this game. The events of Castle Oblivion heavily influence the events of this one. A not significant amount of organization members die at Castle Oblivion, which shapes how the game progresses and even causes drama for Roxas, as he's not sure if Axel survived. It also reflects the organization's lack of emotions, as these people who have grown to work closely with pass away, and they speak about it as if it's a common occurrence or inconsequential. Setting these two games in the same time period is interesting because the events of each actually strengthens the writing of the other. You can understand more of the narrative of Chain of Memories with the context this one provides and vice versa. In fact, the people we thought were traitors in the game might have been the straight and narrow ones all along. Axel and Syax shared this conversation in days. I knew the time would come when Vexen and Zexion got in your way. That's why I took the initiative and cleared the way to the top for you. I can handle all the dirty work. You go all the way to the top. Which seems to imply that Syax himself is actually the one plotting against Zemnis, or at the very least, Vexen wasn't a part of the coup. Back to Shion, the organization decides that they only need one Keyblade wielder, and so secretly dawn to pit them against each other, the stronger of the two coming out on top and acting as their Keyblade wielder. This would have worked had it not been for Axel meddling in the middle of the situation. They also recognize that Shion holding Sora's memories hostage means that Sora himself can't wake up, a perfect opportunity for them to have a Keyblade of their own and eliminate the main ones standing in their way. Unfortunately, they didn't account for the strength of will exhibited in both Shion and Roxas, and by the time their plan to have one of them destroy the other came to a close, Roxas decided to leave the organization and find out who he really is. Speaking of strength of will, I think that's the next point I want to touch on. This game, like many of the organization-based plot points, and well, the whole series really, focuses heavily on the heart. The nobodies of the organization don't have hearts and so search for them. This is why they collect hearts from the heartless to build kingdom hearts, which Xemnas says will give them hearts of their own, essentially turning them back into real people. According to Axel, all of the nobodies have memories of their past life, and so remember what it was like to have feelings, which is why some of them seem to have feelings when that's actually impossible. Roxas, on the other hand, doesn't have such memories, and so can't even fake having emotions like the others. Hence why he starts out the game as a husk of a person, a zombie as they put it later on. This changes over time though. Roxas becomes more and more emotionally connected, whether that be anger, happiness, or love, and it mostly seems connected to Axel and Shion. Some of the organization members show a propensity to exhibit emotions more than others. Axel, Roxas, and Shion are ones that are more emotionally connected. Xemnas, Syax, and Lexius, on the other hand, are the opposite, rarely showing any emotion at all. What this game is trying to say is that the relationship that Roxas, Axel, and Shion share is the source of their emotional connection, both to each other and to themselves. Essentially, they are able to develop hearts, have emotions, truly care about things, not simply because they remember what it was like, because two of the three of them don't, but because of their relationship. While they don't have hearts literally, they might as well. That's what Zimnus, Syax, and many of the other organization members don't really understand. They wouldn't need to fight so hard to have hearts if they would just lay down their weapons and embrace the power of friendship. And that's really what a big part of this series is about, right? The power of friendship being the thing that ties everything together. Sora's inherent ability to become friends with anybody being the link that brings them all together. It's not because of the Keyblade that Sora is the bridge between worlds, but because of his heart. And what I love so deeply about the concept of the Nobody is that they created a group of villains who don't have hearts specifically to explore this concept, of friendships being the source of our very beings, essentially. Through friendships, even Nobodies, creatures that don't have the right to be, that shouldn't exist, suddenly deserve to exist, deserve to be. They have left a mark on other people, and that mark is what gives them purpose, what gives their existence meaning. A nobody can be somebody simply by forming strong connections with others. And that's exactly what makes Shion's story so heartbreaking. 
Did she not deserve to exist? She had just as much heart as anyone else, but because of the circumstances surrounding her creation, she can't go on without taking the life of someone else. To someone's, in fact. And so she decides to give herself up, an act of grace, not of justice. An act of love. The same love a real person might give to someone else. And she's less than a nobody. She's literally a blank slate meant to copy someone else. If she could develop a heart solely through the connection she made, the nobodies could too. And for a series that desires so intensely to explore what it means to have a heart, to have feelings, especially for others, I think that's a powerful message. What I just talked about is probably worth the price of admission, maybe not to actually play the DS version, but at least to watch the cutscenes. Now I briefly want to speak of a couple things that aren't as effective. Firstly, there's an idea floating around that the mundanity of the gameplay is actually on purpose in service of the game's deliberately boring aesthetic. Roxas is bored and doesn't care about his work and neither should you. I've even heard it said that Nomura himself confirmed this, though in all my searching I can't find evidence of this. Maybe someone in the comments will let me know if this is true or not. Regardless, I will move forward because it is an idea I've seen. My arguments can also be used any other time. You might see this type of idea parroted for any series, so consider this an ammo dump for all you debaters out there. Just don't be rude about it and more cool. The problem with this is that, as you might expect, the game is still a game. Kingdom Hearts games are built on a strong foundation of engaging action RPG gameplay, and so if the developer's intention was to make the gameplay boring to serve the narrative, then I would say those intentions are flawed from the onset. It's also too easy to hide behind that as an excuse for why the gameplay turned out so poor. Of course they wanted it to be bad, that's the only thing that explains how it happened in the first place. Consider for a moment that they just messed up this time around. It happens. It just happened in this series, and believe me, it will happen again. More times than not, in fact, if memory serves correctly. Furthermore, we as the players don't need to be bored with the gameplay to understand Roxas's boredom, and in fact, wouldn't this point be made better if the mission structure was incredibly dynamic and kept us on our toes the whole time, only for Roxas to then still be bored by it all? Then we as players could have the engaging mission structure while feeling the contrast of Roxas not even caring that much. The player isn't bored, but we still get this sense that the main character is. Regardless, explaining bad gameplay away with a narrative reason will always fall short with me unless it only happens for, say, a level of the game, like in the case of the wooden sword in KH1, in which it's clearly intended. I truly don't believe that a team as smart as Square Enix would actually make an entire game boring on purpose just so we could connect with the main character more. Another aspect that sort of gets in the way is the overarching narrative that pokes its ugly head in every now and again. In this one, it mostly focuses on those weird rooms, the Chamber of Repose and the Chamber of Waking, spoken of in that one bafflingly terrible cutscene in KH2. We still don't have any solid idea what is going on with these chambers, and so their inclusion here is only to set up plot points that will come back up later. Every time they are said, it's cringy, as it's always written with that same we have to put our information somewhere type of writing that screams, why would these people be having this conversation? It's ham-fisted, frankly, and serves little purpose for this game and its goals. I don't want the last few paragraphs to disparage the game too much. I really don't think this is enough to make the game not worth your time, at least the cutscenes. There is one more element I do want to discuss though, one that I think most people don't really see in it often. This is a nostalgic game. Not that I'm nostalgic toward, in fact I'm curiously not that nostalgic for it as I stated earlier in the video. No, the narrative of this game has undertones of nostalgia. The reason most of the nobodies are able to exhibit any emotions at all is because of their memories, memories being a key part of nostalgia. Later in the game, Roxas is nostalgic for even the beginning parts of his life, especially the day that he met Shion. Roxas immediately realizes after Shion's death that a chapter of his life, one that he longs to go back to, is over, another product of a nostalgic desire to return to a place in one's life that they have left. While not being a primary theme of the game, I think nostalgia permeates through the whole narrative in one way or another, even being a core element element of the nobodies as a whole. This game makes me nostalgic, but not for it. It makes me think about nostalgia of times in my life gone by. Listen to this. What does it make you think of? If you pictured a snowy landscape, dead trees in the background, that's good because that's what the artist intended. 
This is a song by Jackal App, and bearing my past plainly to you for a moment, I was pretty big into the MLP fandom back in 2011 and 2012. I was young, but old enough to be self-aware. Right in that sweet spot where memories turn into little daggers of longing for a simpler time. I came crashing back to that time when I looked into my old email account from back then and found my Google Drive full of old documents related to that fandom. This happened on October 12th, 2019. The crushing thing is, that very day was the day the series finale of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic aired. What pulled me back to that place? Was it purely coincidental? Or did some force-like disturbance call out to me, scratch my brain just enough to remind me of a long-forgotten part of myself that had ended and was on that day ending once again? It makes me realize that nostalgia is a byproduct of how we grow. It makes me think of a cake, or maybe ice cream if you prefer. Ice cream is made up of a number of different ingredients, and in that separated form is how it begins. Through a process of cooking, mixing, churning, and freezing, disparate ingredients become a single whole, a thing entirely different from what came before. This is what living is, what growing up is. As much as I am a little bit embarrassed to admit it, that fandom is one of the many, many ingredients of who I am today. As people, I think we recognize these pieces of ourselves that made us who we are. And when we come into contact with those ingredients, it causes nostalgia in us. Music in particular affects me significantly, though not just any music from my childhood, this music from my childhood. It's not the best, perhaps it's impressive for being made entirely by amateurs, but I could critique just as I critique anything. But when I listen to this music, it brings me back to a part of myself that I forgot exists. When I hear this song, I hear that snowy landscape, but I also hear the years of distance between me and it. I hear the part of me that longs to be back there. These ingredients, this ingredient in particular, is so interwoven into my current whole that my wife can't experience them. I am unable to share them with her because she was not a part of that perfect storm of situations that led me into enjoying what I enjoy, that led me into finding more meaning in something that really shouldn't carry as much meaning as it does. I have grown into a more ever closer to perfect version of myself than I was back then due to these things, and I can't pull them apart to share them with anyone anymore. The only people that can understand what this exact feeling is like are those that too have this ingredient somewhere deep inside of them, and even then, their reaction to coming into contact with this feeling may be wholly different than mine was. These things are so interwoven into my being, even I can't find their source, can't pick them out, can't really see them anymore. The ironic thing about nostalgia is that it consumes the feelings, the memories that created it. When I listen to this music, I can't remember what it felt like back then. I only know the feeling of longing, this empty-hearted sense that is simultaneously comforting and disturbing, like I'm looking at a ghost of a loved one. Like I'm acutely, dangerously aware that the time I had back then will never come back that that chapter of my life is over, but perhaps it ended in a way that didn't give me proper closure. Maybe it's because I stopped watching the show. Maybe it's because I don't remember any of the people that I met in that community that became my friends for that relatively short portion of my life. I'm not this nostalgic, whether in size or kind, for many things. Nothing quite touches the level of nostalgia that this fandom gives me, but one thing that does come close is Kingdom Hearts. Certain songs will create in me a remembrance of the time when I would wake up early simply to have a chance to play Kingdom Hearts 1 or 2 before going to school. Funnily enough, I still do that to an extent. The reason I'm afraid to talk about this game, to continue talking about these games, is because I don't want to tear down something that has always meant so much to me. Deep down, I know myself, and I know that when it comes to things like the media I consume, I have a tendency to remember to look at the bad stuff more than the good stuff. I have lived in relative blissful ignorance of the true nature of this series' shortcomings, and I'm afraid my exploration into the negative going forward might just drown my positive feelings in a sea of criticism. I don't desire this. It's not something that I want for myself. I'm not going to stop because that part of me that's curious, that one day wants to say that I have played an objectively perfect game, can't help but desire to find the faults in what I love, because it knows that those faults rarely destroy my enjoyment, but enhance it for what I do still love. But my opinions of this series are in flux. I have found many faults in the games that I adore and much to love in the games that I knew had more flaws than not. What I'm afraid of is that I won't see the good in the games that I already know I don't like, and that this downpour of negativity will wash away any desire to see that good. It doesn't feel good. It feels like I'm fighting my best friend. It feels like I'm fighting a part of me. And if I do choke out my love for this series, so much so that even the older titles no longer give me joy anymore, I might just be choking out that part of myself. And if I lose that, I lose a piece of me that has been folded into the person I am today. I lose a friend. And if that happens, 
who else will I have ice cream with? for watching. If you enjoyed this style of video, I've got plenty more on my channel for you to dig into, and if you really enjoyed this video, consider supporting me through YouTube memberships. Those at the middle and highest tier, which you can see on the screen right now, get access to this video a week early, and those at the highest tier also get access to another video in which I discuss the original music from this game in detail. They also get their name read out loud, so here goes. Devilorn! You, my friend, are my biggest fan, considering monetary investment. The rest of my members' names are on the screen currently. Humble beginnings and all that. In all seriousness, you should only consider supporting me through memberships if you feel my content is worth the monthly payment. The rewards are just a cherry on top of the cake. I won't be offended if you don't, but Toby might.